The opinions and viewpoints expressed in .NET Rocks are not necessarily those of its sponsors or of Microsoft Corporation, its partners, or employees. .NET Rocks is a production of Franklin's Net, which is solely responsible for its content. Franklin's Net, training developers to work smarter. Rockheads, stop rewinding your MP3 collection and listen up. It's time for another stellar episode of .NET Rocks, the internet audio talk show for .NET developers with Carl Franklin and Rory Blythe. This is Jeff Maciulik here to announce show number 81 with guest Joe Stagner, recorded live Friday, September 17th, 2004. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net, training developers to work smarter and now offering hands-on VBNet, ASP.NET, and C-Sharp classes online at www.franklins.net. And by Data Dynamics, makers of ActiveReports.net. Simple, powerful, and cost-effective reporting for Windows Forms and ASP.NET web applications. Online at www.datadynamics.com. And by Dundas Chart, advanced technology, advanced results. Online at www.dunduschart.com. Support is also provided by Code Magazine, Microsoft Technologies in-depth for IT managers and developers, online at www.code-magazine.com. And now, the man who thinks Borcon sounds like an Star Trek anti-federation convention, Carl Franklin! Digital blood without anything. Yeah. Gotta get enough you will be assimilated. Resistance is futile. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Carl Franklin. You're listening to another episode of .NET Rocks, the internet audio talk show for .NET developers. Now that I've got that out of the way, let me introduce Rory Blythe, my co-host out in Portland, Maine. Portland, Oregon. Did I say Portland, Maine again? Out in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> the other Portland. <laughs> How are you, my friend? Well, it's kind of like, it's, it's like starting the live show late. You know, it's just sort of tradition to every once in a while call it Portland, Maine. It's not a big deal. Yeah, it's okay. We all know what you're talking about. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, things are going well. Uh, I presented in Olympia this week in Seattle, which was exciting. Ooh, um, ah, ooh. Olympia crowd was really good. The the Redmond crowd was really exciting. It, I have my blue badge now, though. That's that's that was like the the resistance you know, the is futile in frosting. Yeah, I finally got my Microsoft chip installed. Is basically <laughs> what I'm saying. No, I got onto campus and I, and I got my I got my uh, badge activated and I just started walking randomly through buildings just to see what doors it would open. I uh, I left the security building and just started waving it at every single little black badge reader I could possibly find until I got lost and I didn't remember where my car was and I had to find somebody to explain to me how to get back to uh, where I had started but uh, I walked through a whole bunch of hallways I ran into some friends I saw uh, a lot of the MSDN team yeah um, as I magically wound up in building five after walking through like three cafeterias and uh, did you like see a bowling the, uh, alley did you I mean, see the .NET Rocks I really poster over there alley, but I remembered uh, I remember that there was a .NET Rocks poster around there somewhere but I didn't see it I can't um, remember I where. didn't know where I was most of the time though so I, I didn't have any sort of context or bearing for what was going on I just knew that I kept walking walking by this fountain <laughs> and a basketball court and and I just kept wondering where I was. But and, you have uh, a little button on yeah, your so keychain that you night, can press and late. somebody will come and 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 save you and rescue you and take you back <laughs> to where you were supposed to be, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somebody, one of the other Borg, will sense that I'm feeling out of place, and That's they'll right. know I don't even have to press a button because we are a we are a one mind, you know. So. Right, right. But uh, yeah, it was awesome. It was it was a lot of fun. So got back last night, late, late, late last night. But uh, I am I'm so pumped. I've decided that um, my job is better than Bill Gates' job. I think I have the best job in the entire cool. universe. That's That's cool. what I learned this week. So uh, I'm good. So how are you, Mister Mister Sicky, Mister? Uh, I am. Person? I do have a cold, and I'm going to try to refrain from blowing my snots out during the show. It's just out of respect for the audience, you know. I'm just uh, I'm going to. If I have to speak with a nose full of phlegm, you know, that's the way it goes. <laughs> Did you say something? I'm no, sorry, Kurt. <laughs> Uh, so no, it's been a fine week. Um, interesting week. I actually had a couple of people in my class this week. Um, one of them had done some cold fusion. The other one had done a little cold fusion, but had never done VB ever and was a manager. Uh huh. 
and uh, was hadn't like written any code in a while, I guess. And I don't know what they were doing in my class. Not only that, um, but she was a slow typist, and it, she just got very, very frustrated. And uh, towards towards huh. the end of Thursday, she left early, and uh, you know, right at a critical time. And then Friday, she came in. She said, right. uh, "I've made a decision." We're not going to use .NET for our project. I think it sucks. <laughs> yeah. She said, Can I tell you something that's kind of related? It'll take 12 seconds. It'll take sure. 12 seconds. Sure. I, I, just want, I just want to say I gave an MSDM presentation in, I want to say it was Boulder. And we have these evaluation forms. So you rate us from 1 to 9. And then you explain why you gave us that particular rating. And somebody gave me a 4 in Boulder. And she wrote in the summary, in the, in the comment field, I don't use computers very much except maybe for the internet. <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> like, because she doesn't use computers, my presentation on programming was bad. Right. So I can kind of see where this comes from, right? You know, somebody comes in and they bring their experiences to the table and because something didn't gel with them or jive with them, uh, the technology itself is at fault. I right? thought it was kind of humorous. I did feel bad for her, though, because, you know, they spent a week and they know now a little bit more about it. But, um, th- you know, another problem was th- that she was like in charge of stuff and they barely let her get away for the week. So she, you know, sh- she was getting uh-huh. IM'd all week and she was getting emailed and her cell phone was ringing. She was in and out of class. It was very, very difficult and challenging for her to, to keep her uh, head in, in the code. And, uh, so, I, yeah, I felt bad for her, but it was kind of funny that, you know, she said, I've made yeah. a decision. We're not using the .NET because I think it sucks. Yeah. You know, the editor sucks. <laughs> Visual Studio sucks. ASP.NET sucks. And, you know, why God. can't you just press a button and, like, have it generate your forms for you and all this code and stuff? I mean, File new application. Like, yeah, it seems like you have to do a lot of work. <laughs> to do this and I, th- I said you know I like think you're right like programming for yeah. example that kind of work I, said, I th- thought to myself I think you're right good luck with Java because you know that's obviously a better better platform well um, we're going to dub this show yeah. the community show obviously uh, you had a good time in your community aspects this week and Joe Stagner the guest is mm-hmm. a big community champion out here in uh, New England uh, a developer evangelist and he goes around talking to people all the time and uh, he's we, on my team. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And uh, we have uh, he a actually he interviewed me. So yeah. oh oh great great great. So we have a couple of announcements, and we have a lot of email. And the email was all good. I mean, ever since last week when I said that most of the email we get is yeah, Carl, I've been listening to the show, downloaded them all, listen on my way to work, blah blah blah. <laughs> I've been getting a lot of people who <laughs> have like a little XML tag that says boilerplate standard blah 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 <laughs> now that we have that out of the way <laughs> I've seen that yeah. <laughs> but we had a lot of great suggestions and we had uh, interesting comments so there's a lot of email we're going to read today but I have a couple of announcements first first I wanted to announce yes we're teaching C Sharp now at uh, Franklin's Net I'm not personally teaching it but our, our good friend Richard Hale Shaw uh, who's been around in this business for a long time teaching people C++ and C Sharp has is doing a couple of C-sharp.net boot camps, extended versions. That's like the 12-hour days, make you bleed through your eyes kind of coding uh, with homework. Here in New London, uh, two dates, October 18th through the 22nd and November 29th through December 3rd. And if you want more information on that, you can either go to our homepage, www.franklinsnet, or go to shrinkster.com slash nl. And uh, he's going to be doing some classes down here and is very excited. We're very excited to have him. And his stuff is great. Uh, also, I want to also announce and plug Dev Connections, which is handling it, uh, happening at Mandalay Bay Resort in Las Vegas, November 7th that week, uh, uh, www.devconnections.com. This is a, grow- a growing, very popular conference. If you haven't checked it out, go check it out. A lot of the people that you know and love that speak at other conferences are speaking here. And uh, yours truly, plus Juval Lowy, Juval Lowy and I get to pick the speakers and the topics for the C Sharp and VBNet sessions, the Visual Studio side of it. Also, people like Kimberly Tripp and uh, uh, Bill Vaughn speak at the SQL show, which goes on at the same time. And Paul Litwin is the conference chair for, uh, for the ASP.NET side of it, and he picks all the topics for that. Brian Moran, by the way, is the, car- is the chair for the SQL server side and so it's like this multi-topic conference and you can win a harley and it's a lot of fun too it's a great conference so also uh the dot net rocks movie is going to be in stores soon look for that no we're going to have a link to it on our website 
we're working on the final stages of it, and we probably think mm, November. But it's going to be very, very cheap. Basically, we just want to cover our shipping costs, uh, and it's going to be a great movie. A lot of fun. Good for fans. I also want to announce uh, the premiere album of a friend of mine through RCA Records who's been, who made Rolling Stone's hot new songwriter of 2004. He's been in Esquire magazine. He's booked all over the world. Uh, Ray Lamontagne, www.raylamontagne, that's L-A-M-O-N-T-A-G-N-E dot com. I actually met him uh, a couple of years ago up in Maine when he was living in a cabin in the woods with no electricity with his wife and two kids and uh, absolutely Poe. And uh, I recorded a demo for him here and uh, he landed a deal with RCA Records and he's like, like I said, Rolling Stone, Hot New Song Runner 2004. He's got an awesome voice. Anyway, so the mail ensues as follows. Dear .NET Rocks, I am a lowly DBA working at a Fortune 500 company forced to do nothing more than make and restore backups. <laughs> I live for Mondays when I can download the latest DNR show. It is the driving force for me to learn .NET and become a real developer. You guys have really inspired a passion for programming in me. And uh, we got quite a few emails, by the way, that said this, that we were somehow inspirational in, in motivational, which I think is appropriate after last week's show because I was inspired and motivated after listening to Mark. Anyway, I have to give a shout out to my buddies, he says, Travis and Ed, for showing me the light that is .NET Rocks. Keep up the good work. And Carl, I love the music. A million thanks. Kent McConnell, DBA. Kent, your .NET Rocks swag is in the mail. Thank you, sir. And I'm glad, you, uh, glad you're inspired. Hi, Mr. Franklin, sir. Here we go. Quote, found DNR, downloaded old shows, listen on MP3 player while... Action equals driving, yada, yada, yada. Now that that's out of the way, on to what I had to say. I just reached the early 50s and had a couple of comments. On the Dev Days show, the link is out of date. Uh, we're going to have to fix that. He, he gave us the real link. We'll fix that. You can either watch or download versions of all the Dev Days 2004 presentations. It includes presenters like William R., Bill Vaughn, when I hear the word jet, I reach for my pistol, and Chris Kinsman. <laughs> You can also download all the code samples, both tracks and the open hack submission. And maybe Joe can tell us a little more about that. If you've mentioned this already, then I'll find out when I reach that show. Otherwise, people like myself who missed the dev days this year might be interested. Thanks a lot. I have now started to listen to the Kevin McNish show and was a bit disappointed by the Google Weirdos theme. I had always heard it as the old Batman snippet. Ready for this? Go, 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 weirdos. I'm also listening. Yeah, I know it. I'm also listening to each new show as you post it, but I reckon I have another few weeks at least before I reach the present. What will I do once I catch up? I guess I'll have to start listening to all the BBC Seven stuff I've recorded. Keep up the good work. That does include Rory, though I'm not convinced we need any more 256 kbps experiments. And that's from Alastair Russell. Hi, Carl and Rory. I just want to say that you guys have been a lifeline for me. A lifeline? How's that, Rory? Did you know that you were a lifeline? Wow. I mean, that crosses a line from inspirational to, I don't know, sort of obsessive, I think. To um, being responsible. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I don't want that kind of responsibility. I just want to say <laughs> that you guys have been a lifeline for me. I am a stay-at-home dad. Lewis is three years old. Ruby is six months. And have taken a work break. And your show provides a great deal of information, humor, and motivation for me to keep focused on what I've set my sights on, which is becoming a VBNet developer. When I get back into my workplace, two years or so, I get some time during kids' naps and late night to study .NET and to work on code, which is a welcome break and much easier task than raising children full-time. I've listened to most of your shows now, discovered your show about a month ago, and I think you both do an excellent job. I've also used the Franklin site as an excellent learning resource and only wish you guys did some classes and seminars in the UK. Uh, we're working on that, actually. I have also realized that you are very generous when rewarding loyal listeners and prize winners that want to bla and, and want to blatantly request that you consider offering your generosity in my direction. <laughs> <laughs> As a full-time father and someone who desperately wants to become expert in .NET, VB, Microsoft programming, I have a slight drawback in that I cannot afford the most essential tool for professional productive .NET development, Visual Studio .NET. 
It's just out of my budget, as you can appreciate, and I can honestly say it would make my year if you had a copy available for this loyal listener in order to help me develop my skills and prepare me for returning to the workplace in the near future. Also, a few dozen bumper stickers so I can help spread the word about .NET Rocks. Yours sincerely and in uh, anticipation, Richard Thomas. We're going to have to ask uh, Joe if he can spring for a, uh, uh, a, uh, a copy of that. And maybe Rory can. Rory, do you have a marketing closet access yet? Or is that something you have to... Uh, um, I'm, I'm just now kind of learning the ropes about what I can buy and what I can expense and what I can give away and things like that. So I, I okay. have so much to learn about right, well, where we'll that ask stuff Joe. is concerned. So I can't answer anything like that yet. <clears throat> okay. Well, this one is from Ashfin, who says, All, first off, I want to thank you for awesome programs, discussions, and guests that you provide every week. I can't tell you how much I've learned from the DNR shows. <clears throat> Secondly, can I make a couple of program suggestions? One, it would be great if we could hear something on automated build tools and processes. Uh, this and code and team management by far has been one of the areas that I noticed most lacking and behind as I go from one company to the other. I see horror stories of code being lost or people creating EXEs on their local machines and releasing it to the production servers without any accountability, traceability, or versioning. And this guy thinks a show is going to help those people? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if we can do anything for you. Although not a coding topic, is it possible to have Microsoft internal recruiters on the show so we could hear how one can get to work for the man? I know Channel 9 had a couple That'd video cool. episodes, but having guests where we can submit live questions would be great. Yeah, that would be cool, huh? Also something that I think is important, and I don't think that many programmers know of or have used is the Patterns and Practices Code Blocks. Yes, we agree. It would be awesome if we could have some from that group come talk to the rest of us and tell us about some of the application blocks like Exception Handler, the built builtit.net, and how one can increase their productivity by reusing these application blocks in their own applications. Uh, we haven't talked about that in a while, Ashvin, but uh, the show with Matthew, no, with uh, Michael Stewart last year, I think, uh, we talked about those, and he was one of the developers on one of those or two of those blocks. Lastly, I won't bore you with a story of me listening to the shows in the car bit, but I wanted to suggest another way of listening to DNR that is in your shower radio. That's right. You can brush up on your .NET Whoa. knowledge every morning by listening to the show on your shower in your radio. Nudity, I suppose. Yeah, in your nudity. While you shampoo your hair. <laughs> Wait, I guess that rules out the and C++ plus programmers. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's definitely a fan We haven't talked about that in a while Yeah, yeah it's true we sort Yeah, of, that's what I was thinking cool. We sort of leave, left that one in the dust He goes, anyway, I purchased this FM transmitter And we'll give you the link when Richard comes on And he's uh, from Kuala Lumpur He's going to uh, try to connect and tell us about this device That allows me to broadcast your programs Right off my MP3 player On my laptop, right into the shower radio And it works just great just wanted to share that to those who can't get enough of Donnet Rocks. Thank you again for all the great programs. And uh, yeah, you're welcome. And uh, keep listening, and we'll keep on doing it. So this is kind of cool, you hey, know? Carl. It's sort of like the community show. We're, we're getting all these great suggestions and yeah. stuff. Yeah. What's up? Well, speaking of the, speaking of the community show, um, Jim Blizzard, who is out there listening right now, just IM'd me. Okay. And he sent me the uh, link to a blog um, from some... Uh, Microsoft recruiters and they have a post about you know Microsoft recruiting and things like that and Excellent. so the shrinkster address to get to the, to get to the site is shrinkster.com slash n u so even if we don't have a show that's at least a place to get started reading about this stuff um, it sounds like it's going to be kind of right up you awesome. know, this person's alley hey that's so, great yeah cool thanks a lot Jim yeah thank you Jim Jim Blizzard one of our uh, one of our, our our earliest fans actually i don't know if he was listening yeah. to the show before and, you uh, came along or not but he's been a supporter he, for a long time he, I, yeah he was he's a he's a donut developer evangelist out here in the pacific northwest and so he's in tune with a lot of this stuff and a microsoft um, he actually employee. got the show played yeah he's gotten the show played around uh, various microsoft meetings and things so he's he's definitely been there and around excellent thank you cool. jim uh, greg Lowe says hi folks and angle bracket insert standard boilerplate praise comments here <laughs> <laughs> loved last like week's they're all in cahoots I know I know what is that yeah. loved last week's show the bit about the TRS-80 took me back to amazing days like spending $490 to add 16k of memory to my TRS-80 but Mark's master plan for how to make a gazillion dollars had me chuckling and remembering one of the things I tried at the time 
I recall graphics being so slow to almost be unusable. I was wanting to build an app for a dental surgery, uh, so I spent ages replacing all the upper characters in the standard character set with pictures of teeth. <laughs> <laughs> then I could draw someone's <laughs> mouth in text mode. <laughs> oh my god! I think That's I crazy. have to lay claim to building the first tooth character set. <laughs> Another idea that seemed cool at the time. Keep up the good work. Regards, Greg Lowe. P.S. Please That's tell. Cool. I yeah. Go ahead. Oh, oh, I was just gonna say I did something similar using um, MS Basic 1.0. I uh, I wrote a little app that allowed me to kind of hook into into that stuff and at least temporarily replace some of the uh, ASCII word characters with my own images, although it really sucked and, and it was all cumbersome and I was never able to put it to any real use. But, man, it was there. So I know what he went through. You know, it's a pain. Yeah. But it's fun. Those were the days. Those were kind of the days. Those but were I'm sorry, fun going days. with the PS. <laughs> yeah, PS, please tell Roy that the MSDE is not limited to five connections. More info at shrinkster.com slash right. yeah. NF. And I think that was just a... A quick yeah. reference. That yeah, the road dog knows that. Um, yeah, it's not limited to five connections, but the workload governor is going to start st- is going to turn on a five connections, right. and then it's just going to make your day miserable. I might have said last show that it was limited to five connections because, in a practical sense, it might yeah, as well be. Might as well be. So, so yeah. that uh, shrinkster dot com slash nf is an is a pointer to an article on MSDN all about the workload governor in MSDE. And uh, let's see. And uh, Joe Stagner is chomping at the bit. I, I can see, and I am. He's going to talk about that when he comes on in a few minutes. Uh, hi, Carl, Rory, Jeff, Kirk, and Richard. Boy, we're getting quite a staff Ooh. here now, aren't we? Okay, yeah. I know. I was listening to the show about Charles Petzold, and it reminded me uh, of a program I used in university called Electronics Workbench. It allows you to build circuits, gates, etc. in software. I'm not sure if the software is still in existence. It seems the company has changed, but it was really cool. What's funny is during the show, I was coding using the book called Programming Microsoft Windows with Microsoft Visual Basic.net, written by Charles Petzold. Talk about shivers up the <laughs> spine. Thanks for keeping it real. P.S. Rory, the Chris Sells song kicks ass. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, God. You're not going to do it. I like the, ch- I like the chicken dance version. Oh, that's really cool. A storm in his tartan man gown. When dancing round the fire. Oh, I see. We just stop it. Well, yeah, it doesn't work when you sing with it because you have a delay <laughs> and it sounds like, you know, <laughs> sounds like Rory Blythe on acid. It's kinda. like it's around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's enough of that anyway. So we'll, uh, you'll have to listen yeah, to last week's show to hear the whole thing. Enough of that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, regards, that was from Chris uh, Stepanek. And this was from Michael Elsdorfer. Hi again. Now that I've listened to the latest episode, I found that you had the Tron guy in there again. Guess that should be enough. <laughs> With the offline shows, you're always late. Anyway, I thought I'd just let you know that I strongly endorse Christopher's suggestion from the mails. Get some Borland people on the show. Even if Mark seemed to be not so enthusiastic about Delphi lately... Which I think he still likes Delphi, uh, whatever. You'll have to ask him about that. But it's still the best tool for Win32 development. And Delph, in, you know, okay. And the Delphi 9 <laughs> news you hear from Borcon these days are stunning. Visual Studio will look like crap in comparison. Okay, just exaggerating Ooh. a bit here. <laughs> he says he's exaggerating a bit there, but I think we're going to take the bait. And, uh, yeah. Anyway. Or as an alternative, get one of the guys from Rem Object Software. They're currently constructing a Pascal compiler for .NET. Well, that ought to be uh, groundbreaking. Which integrates directly into Visual Studio and has some powerful new language concepts. They're a really small company, but doing an awesome job, and it would be some well-deserved publicity. Well, I guess they got it. Uh, and Kurt Kopchick says, Hey, what's up, Carl and Rory? First off, I want to say thanks for the .NET Rocks mug. I received the Live Every Friday mug when you guys were still doing the show on Thursdays. <laughs> now that you're back on Fridays, my mug doesn't seem so much like so overstock. <laughs> you guys were trying to unload. <laughs> I know, seriously, the next time we change, I'm, I'm going to take all the schedule off. You know, It's just going to be, say, .NET Rocks, and that's it. Well, it should just say live on and then have a little blank line where you can fill it in with a felt tip marker. Yeah, that's a good idea. I've been a long time listener and really enjoy the show. <clears throat> the one with Charles Petzold was one of my favorites. After the show, I picked up a copy of Code and read it cover to cover. What an awesome book. 
I also read Coding Slave, which yeah. seemed to me more like soft porn than anything else. Porn's awesome, man. <laughs> That's why we liked it. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm really into new technology, and I've been working on a .NET project for a while now that I thought you guys might find interesting. It's a contactless smart card that contains all of your user preferences and contact settings. Wallpaper, favorites, address book, etc. And when you walk in front of your computer with a service running, the settings switch to your own and revert back when you walk away. Awesome. Yes, yeah, there he's is... kind of ahead of his time there. That's uh, really yeah, cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, there is an option to prompt for a password if you don't want it to work automatically. The whole key is that it's wireless. You can put the card in your wallet and not have to do anything for a computer to be customized like your desktop at home. Is this a totally ridiculous idea or do you think it has some potential? Potential? I think it's great. I put together an early beta written in VBNet and C Sharp that works with USB drives and our contact smart cards at www.includeclass.com. Uh, I never had it screw up a machine, but since it is still in beta, you can check it out. If you check it out, you might want to do so on a test machine. Thanks again for the awesome shows. Keep rocking. And man, that's uh, that's the that's yeah, the mail. Cool. I, I we just had so much good stuff that I wanted to share it all. So, and uh, after the mail, we usually do the news. And here with the news is uh, the news of the week, Mr. Roy Black. Now obey. So, Roy, what happened this week in .NET land? All right, I got a few things. Um, the first thing I'm putting up is, uh, is a link to an article about this new system where if you head out to uh, download some Windows software, I don't recall exactly which site it is, but if you head out to download Windows software, you will be asked um, if Microsoft is allowed to check your computer to see if your copy of Windows is registered or not, which I thought was kind of interesting because every time Microsoft implements like a new... Um, like piracy uh, or a new addition to its piracy program, a lot of people wind up getting really up in arms. Uh, and I always think it's interesting because, I mean, it, you'd think the only people who are going to get really upset are the people who are stealing Windows. But uh, either either way, it's still it's still, still some interesting food for thought. So the link to that is going to be shrinkster.com slash NM. And, and so that's some cool. interesting stuff. The next one, and we, I don't usually bring up anything at all political here, but I can't help it because this is a particularly compelling article uh nature has taken the some of the scientific views of the two presidential candidates the two real presidential candidates and broken them up among five different categories and uh just taking a look at what they think about different topics related to science and that's pretty important to me and i imagine i i hope it's important to other people because in my opinion we probably shouldn't have a country that's run by people who you know derive their uh, I guess their their agendas from strange irrational belief systems. Uh, I think it's great to you know do whatever it is that you want to do on your own time, but when it comes to speaking for 300 million people, you should probably be doing things in a very straightforward you know straight edge rational way. Yeah. So the the link to that it's a it's a nature dot com it's uh, shrinkster dot com slash n n, um, and they cover all sorts of things in there that are very interesting. Okay. Next cool. uh, listener Mark sent out a link to an article uh, about how there's a university project trying to get .NET to run on Lego Mindstorm, which yeah. is really cool. I, I always want, yeah, I always wanted to, to get into the Lego Mindstorm thing. And if, it, if there were a way to do .NET on Lego Mindstorm, that would just be awesome. So the link to that is shrinkster.com slash NR. All right. And so the next one, uh, this is interesting. Uh, I, Bill Gates has given like 20 some odd million dollars through the Bill, through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Oh, cool. And that's, that's really cool. That's a good thing. You know, I love the Gates Foundation and all that stuff. Um, this is one of those things I always talked about in the past whenever I got into a big argument with Linux uh, or just any zealot who talks about how greedy everybody at Microsoft is. But in response to this, and at least this is what was written on Slashdot, and it is hearsay. I don't know if it's true. Uh, there is a quote. That says, some faculty have suggested that in acknowledgement of Mr. Gates' profound influence on the computer software industry, the building should be painted bright blue. Okay. As in, blue screen. Okay. And all Aww. I have to say about that is at least they don't have to compile the goddamn building before they use it. Okay. <laughs> so, that's the news of the week. Um, the link to that is going to be shrinkster.com slash NP. So, you can go read about it there. Awesome. Thanks, man. 
Always great to hear what's going on and in, in things that you're interested in during that segment. I love it. Well, anyway, uh, it's time to announce the guest. Here we are, you know, 9.43 p.m., and we got a late start, so we're about a half hour into the show, I think. And uh, let me introduce Joe Stagner. Joe Stagner joined Microsoft in 2001 as a technical evangelist and is now our developer community champion with the Microsoft MSDN team. Joe brings more than 25 years of diverse information technology and software engineering experience to Microsoft, including everything from several startups and venture capital-funded companies to writing low-level device drivers and serving as president and CEO of a publicly traded New York City consulting firm. Joe's development experiences have allowed him to create commercial software applications across a wide diversity of technical platforms from mainframes through Unix and Linux to Microsoft technologies on the Intel and mobile computing platforms. While Joe is generally interested in all computing technology, in recent years he has been particularly focused on highly performant geoscalable web application architectures, multi-platform interoperability, and writing secure code. In addition to Joe's regularly scheduled MSDN events, which you can check out at www.msdnevents.com, and Microsoft webcasts, Joe is a regular speaker at developer events like TechEd, the Microsoft Global Briefing, Microsoft Developer Summit, Dev Days, Web Services Edge, etc., as well as user groups throughout the American Northeast. Joe can be contacted at www.managecode.com, managedcode.com, or through his blog at blogs.mstn.com slash Joe Stagner. Will you please welcome my friend and colleague, Joe Stagner. What's up, man? Hey, Carl. God, that sounds like a bunch of marketing crap. <laughs> it's actually really cool. Well, if you want something that doesn't sound like marketing crap, um, the, the guys out in the chat room are arguing right now about whether or not you look like Stone Cold Steve Austin, the professional wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> Uh, you do have a lot of experience, though, and a lot of experience on different platforms before, uh, you know, um, before .NET. And so, you know, I think it's valuable to have that sort of perspective. You know, a lot of the people that we have on the show are total .NET heads and zealots and, uh, and didn't, didn't, haven't necessarily had experience with these other platforms and, and all this kind of stuff. So, Yeah, you know, the, the guys on my team you know, pick on me that I've been writing code for money for 25 years, which means that I started pro- programming professionally before most of my team was born. Yeah, ouch. Um, <laughs> I just tell them I started writing code when I was three. <laughs> but, uh, Yikes. So uh, I got a kick out of Delphi comic because I, I just spent the week out at Borcon uh, in San Jose, California last week. And, uh, and I'm actually, I've got, uh, I've got, what your fan referred to as Delphi 9, which right. actually isn't really Delphi 9, um, running on my machine here. They gave me a copy of it while I was out there. Uh, it's called Diamondback. And and uh, if you had it running side-by-side side with Visual Studio.net, you probably couldn't tell the difference. Wow. Uh, especially since it hmm. not only can you write Object Pascal code in it, but you can write C-sharp code as well. Okay, so is this like the new, uh, the new edition of C Sharp Builder? What that morphed into, or you know, I, I think there was really there was no mention of new product versions for either C Sharp Builder or C plus plus Builder the whole week that I was out there. Um, but uh, but Diamondback uh, is is a single IDE that will support both the Delphi language as well as C Sharp and theoretically any other language that a third party might make a deal with them to, to integrate. Hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it looks so much like visual studio.net. It's, uh, it's an amazing coincidence. Yeah. Well, what does he, what do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> it, just, it, it, it just looks like a snapshot. I mean, it looks it, it, at a glance. Huh. I mean, I'm sure there are, you know, I'm sure there are, are, are nuances and I'm not, I'm not bashing Delphi by any stretch of the imagination. I was a Turbo Pascal user. I was a Delphi user I, from one through version eight, um, and uh, you know I'll probably buy uh, buy Diamondback too. But um, I mean, side by side, you know, at a glance, you couldn't tell the difference between the two the two IDEs. They've, they've made uh-huh. it look very much uh, like Visual Studio .NET, which I think is you know probably a good thing. And um, it seemed like a lot of the developers that I talked to uh, out at Borcon, at least the uh, you know the 
the Delphi 8 developers also used, um, used Visual Studio .NET. And it was, it was interesting talking to um, uh, a lot of the Delphi guys. The, the, um, the team, the BorgCon is, um, uh, is a smaller conference than, than a lot of ours. There were about, I guess, about 1,500 developers there. Huh. Um, and, of course, they have sort of two major IDE focuses, um, one's the you know .NET and uh, and Win32 side, and the, and the other is uh, that other platform. Right. And um, it it was interesting. Uh, I got to spend a fair bit of time with um, some of the the core Delphi team, and they've done a lot of work in Diamondback. Um, although it will still support Win32 development, they've done a lot of work to make it um, easy and sort of elegant to develop con- .NET componentry in Delphi that looks and plays nice with C Sharp and VB code. Oh, that looks good. That sounds good anyway. Yeah, it was, it was cool stuff. I, and I was also surprised that really the, uh, the, the Borland, the Borland uh, developer audience is, um, was a really sort of very sort of viscerally Borland, you know, long-time Borland users love Borland, but not, you know, not sort of, uh, not as zealous as some of the other uh, communities that we we sometimes get to talk now, to. Now, for example, who would some of those other communities be? It's going to start out getting me in trouble. You do a, you do a disclaimer at the top of the show, right? Absolutely. That, that, yeah. uh, that, that all the opinions expressed here may not necessarily reflect those of Microsoft. Absolutely. <laughs> We're talking to Joe Stagner, not Microsoft. Yeah. The, um, well, yeah, I mean, you know, there, there, are, uh, there are a couple of things. That the, I mean, the open source community really runs the gamut. And I always think it's funny that, that you know, all the open sourcers think Microsoft is so anti-open source. We, you know, Microsoft is not at all anti-open source. Uh, what we are anti is anti-GPL, right? We sort of think, you know, we, we live in America. Acronym police here. What's that? Acronym police here, GPL. Oh, sorry. The, uh, the GNU public license, which is, which is basically this viral, viral agreement that says that, uh, you, if you have a really bright idea, you have to give it away, and you can't profit from it yourself. Uh, that, that's that's of course my sarcastic uh, interpretation. But b- basically, the, the, the GPL in a nutshell means that um, if you use code that's based on the GPL um, and you you make modifications, you are required by virtue of that license to give away the intellectual property that that you develop in extending that code that was ba- originally based on the GPL. So yeah. basically means you come, you come up with a great idea if you've based any piece of that great idea on code that was issued under the GPL, you have to give all your source code away. Now, Rory, I know you got some opinions on open source, which, uh, which are pretty moderate. Um, how, what's your response to that? I'm I'm actually totally in line with that. The GPL, I don't really have a problem with the GPL if somebody else would like to make use of the GPL, but I personally probably would not want to GPL any of the software that I write, and I would probably think twice before I started getting involved with a GPL project. B, the BSD licenses are typically a, a bit more uh, a bit more open, a bit easier on you. So, like uh, when you're dealing with the BSD license, the the general you know, just if it is typically that you can write whatever you want, you know, and and you can give it away. And somebody who takes your software can do whatever they want with it, compile it, and not contribute back to the original, you know, source. And they can make money off of it. So things are open source, but it also gives you the option to close things off and and profit from the system if if you'd really like to do that. And it's it's really it. I think that's the way it really ought to be. That's the the GPL is really like, you know, it, it's it's like this dictator of a license. Um, it forces you into doing things a certain way, whereas, you know, you deal with the BSD license and you still have some freedom. And that's important to me, I guess. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, so the other community is, of course, the Java community. Is that what you were talking about? <laughs> yeah, the, the Java community. <laughs> now, the Java community, we, we <laughs> like now, right? Microsoft is playing nice with Sun. And, well, so. I mean, we've always liked them, but you know what I'm saying. I'm exaggerating. So, so you're probably referring to all the. You know all the photographs that you saw with you know with Steve Ballmer sitting up on stage with Scott McNeely you know with his arm around yeah, him yeah yeah and Scott McNeely with the big grin on his face happy happy joy joy yeah but you know Carl you know 
You'd be grinning too if somebody just handed you a check for a couple of billion dollars. Well, okay, yeah. Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. I mean, I'm not. Uh, I'm sort of this, you know, this schizophrenic guy who, you know, my my teammates at Microsoft call me a traitor because I'm always, you know, arguing about, you know, where our shortcomings are, our, you know, our technology shortcomings are. You're a truth seeker. That's what you are. Other stuff, yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a big sort of PHP fan. I've been doing some work with Zen recently, and I've, you know, I've written a lot of Java code in my in my career. And um, I do have to say, though, uh, the uh, the Java keynote at Borcon was was one of the most amazing talks that I've ever seen as a keynote address at a conference. For for what reason? I've never seen a speaker that could clear a room <laughs> as effectively as uh, Ono Klut did. The, uh, I mean, he's a really bright guy. He's the director of the JCP, but he just he didn't talk really about technology. He just talked about the philanthropy of the Java community process. And he what, start, what's start, that acronym you just used there? JCP. The, the JCP is the Java community process. Okay. So it's um, you know it's funny that he. he um, uh, Isn't process a strong word? For, <laughs> anyway. Well, it was funny that he was talking about the community process, and you know, the, uh, I'm I te- I'm normally a glasses half full kind of guy, but I do work for Microsoft, so I you know I you know I, I see you know sort of both sides of the argument and things. But he uh, uh, he was talking about how he was they were happy that um, that almost something like thirty five percent of the specifications that they would started got finished. Um, which he seemed to think was a great number. I didn't. I didn't think it was quite so hot. And um, mm-hmm. uh, he, he had a great, a great quote. He, he said something to the effect of that uh, uh, they didn't really write a spec for Java until after they'd finished the first version, and then they wrote a spec to match the work that they'd done. <laughs> really? Um, yeah. But <laughs> it's a ballsy individual. They could have generated that. the spec from the code, probably. <laughs> <laughs> they could have written a spec generator in Java. That, that's right. Yeah, that's, yeah, I yeah, never really yeah, thought about the, doing that before. It's <laughs> a right. Java Docs thing. <laughs> that so. is awesome. <laughs> Writing a spec generator so it'll generate it from the code. I'm going to do that, that's and a, I'm going to open source it. That's, that's a awesome. Rory comment. Right. I had a flash of humor there that uh, <laughs> that smacked of Neapolitan.com. Maybe okay. Rory infected I'll my brain it remotely. Too. Yeah. But, I mean... Yeah. Write, you know, a, write a write a spec generator, and then I'll use it to generate its own specs. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Get a little side but, I, I usually don't find the, the, the Java community, I mean, those guys, at least in my experience here in New England, and, you know, New England has a lot of academics here. There's a lot of, well, you know, yeah. probably, you're, sure. you're in the there's a lot, of, a lot of Java folks because of the concentration of academia. And, and yeah. It, the, the Java folks seem to me to be more, um, in large part, they're, they're not so much zealous like the, you know, like the Slash Daughters are. Uh, they're just more, you know, professional developers. Well, they're more uh, academic, right? They have don't have as much of a sense of humor, you know? Well, I think that, that the Java developers, the reason that they don't have a sense of humor is that they've, you know, they, they, they bet their career on a platform Yeah. Um, that, you know, was a, was a great idea and, and has produced a lot of great technology, but it, sure. it grew in a day when, you know, there was a lot of money around. I mean, any two guys with a PC in their garage can get four or five million dollars in venture capital. And so, you know, it didn't matter if you overspent, you know, um, on your platform build out because, you know, you could always get more money. I, now, I got to say, it sounds like, it may sound like Joe is sort of bashing Java, but he's really, I remember talking to you, Joe, at a Dev Days when you said, you know, these, it was, it was in the early days of uh, SOAP and um, web services before the version of SOAP we have now. I think it was SOAP 1.0. Anyway, <clears throat> you said, you know, these guys could, have got to get their, their tools together, these guys talking about Microsoft, because there was some incompatibilities with, uh, with Java's implementation of SOAP at the time with the current implementation that Microsoft was doing. Right. And it was, it was clearly like a game of catch-up, and Microsoft was, was not catching up. And, and uh, I mean, you're the first to criticize Microsoft when they, when they need to get their act together to do something. So. Yeah, yeah. As as you know, Carl, I, I take a lot of a lot of guff inside the company because I'm, you know, I I, I try and be the, you know, the, the voice that you know doesn't just sort of drink the Kool Aid and nod and right. you know and agree with everybody. And um, yeah, that's a perfect characterization of you, Joe. If I had to pick one thing, yeah. <laughs> and the, I mean, the the uh, just to for the other side of uh, of the experience at Bor- at Borcon, they just uh, they just announced um, 
J Builder 2005. I'm a huge J Builder fan. I'm a, I, I think J Builder is the best Java development tool out there. And um, I'm I'm uh, I, I picked up a copy of it while I was there as well. And and I'm working on a bunch of web services interop demos. And I I think between what what we've done and what um, the Java community has done, but specifically what Borland what the Borland tool offers, um, there's a much higher uh, synergy, at least in in, the, in web services technology, and that's. I mean, I think that's important. Java, you know, Java, Java is never going away. I don't think. I mean, no, it, I don't think so. Either. It, it's always going to be in the enterprise. There are a lot of huge systems that are built on it, um, and so I, I think that, that interop stuff is really important. And I know that uh, you know we've been working with IBM around their Java strategies for a couple of years now, yeah. um, specifically around. Um, Supporting the WS Dash standards uh, in a way that afford us interop between the WebSphere platform and the .NET platform. Do you think a lot more people are using what it, what my brother calls POJO, plain old Java objects, as uh, opposed to like the Enterprise Beans and things like that? Um, I think, at, at least sort of anecdotally, I, I, I think that um, I think Enterprise Java Beans, so the EJB piece. Um, hasn't been nearly as successful a, as it first looked like it was going to be. They're very complex. They're, 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 they have some real performance challenges. Um, I think um, servlets are extremely popular. Um, and regular Java beans are, um, are popular as well. And I think the, that the guys at JBoss, I mean, I how much you, how much you've looked at the JBoss architecture. No, I, I'm not. I, maybe Rory has, but... Not me. So, so th- there's some really cool things about no, JBoss, and you know, you've sort of got to be careful to to be too flat, not to be too flattering to, you know, what might be considered competitive technolo- technologies. But mm-hmm. um, there, there are a couple of really interesting things uh, about JBoss. I mean, aside from the fact that it's it's a it's a functional and free, um, you know, J2E middleware server, um, they did a bunch of architecture uh, rework in the version that that came just after the 9/11 events. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've got this sort of really interesting, theoretically fault tolerant sort of distributable architecture. Um, that's you know it's 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 really some some mm-hmm. innovative stuff I think. And, Do, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, I just uh, you know so it's it's funny that you you know you look at you look at a lot of the stuff that uh, that sort of leapfrogged when .dot net came out. And, and there's a lot of stuff that's happening in the Java community that is sort of a reflection of the success that we've had in .NET. The, if you look at the, what's intended for the tool set around version 1.5, I mean, Sun's been pretty upfront that their intention for uh, for their support for, for tools in the Java 1.5 genre is you know, to make it um, really to target the VB developer, to make tools that have that rad experience. So it, it seems sort of clear that they that they get that there's a huge developer audience that, that only wants to get into the nuts and bolts right. you know, when they need to. Yeah. There is a huge audience that is like that, I know. And as well in the .NET community. <clears throat> and I think uh, VBNet, uh, what are we calling VBNet 2005 now, <laughs> is, uh, I think, what do you think about that? you think that it's going to go... Uh, do, that it's going to live up to what it what they what we hope it's going to do, and that is to sort of woo over the the VB programmers who are now on the fence and not getting .NET through VB .NET one point one. I uh, I I think so. I mean, you know, people tend to tend to be disgruntled by change that's imposed on them rather than change that they choose. Right. Um, and, and that was really, it really was necessary for VB.net. I mean, I know, that, I know that you have good contacts on the VB.net team, but are you aware that, that they spent almost a year trying to make a version of VB.net that was compatible with VB6? I didn't know that. Was it, this before 1.0? Yeah. In, in the, in, during the original VB development, there was, um, there was a lot of effort early on that when it, there, there was, there, they wanted to have sort of a, a VB6 compatibility switch. They wow. Got, and they, they, they went sort of as far down that path as they could, I think. And, and if, you, if you think about it, there are just a collection of things. I mean, VB grew out of, you know, line-oriented basic. So there's a right. lot of uh, constructs in VB6 that just don't map to right. a truly object-oriented Definitely not. environment, that don't map well at all to the, to strong type systems. 
and they figured out that, that in order to to make that compatibility switch switch happen, they they probably would have had to break some of uh, some of .NET in order to make that work. So um, the, the the choice that was made, and I think it was the right one, was just to you know to ask DB developers to feel that pain in the first version. But in, in 2005, I mean, I think you know it's funny. I when I first um, when I decided to come to work at Microsoft, um, I was uh, I was running a publicly traded company in New York City, and I got there because I, I had built a company um, that I sold to U.S. Web Cornerstone, and part of the deal was I had to serve as their CEO for a year. And uh, on the 365th day, I uh, I resigned and um, and hung out for about six months writing code and building a house. Hmm. And, and um, but I I went out to Redmond um, at the uh, at the invitation of Rob Howard, um, and yeah. and met with there was six or seven of, of us that went out to see this new technology that they were working on. That um, we met with Mark Anders and Scott Guthrie and yep. Anders Halsberg, and um, they um, it, it wasn't even called .NET yet. And N-G-W-S. they only knew what's that NGWS. Um, yeah, it was N- it. NGWS. Uh, ASP Plus, they were thinking right. about. And, Everything was plus. Um, yeah. In, in fact, it was while I was there, somebody ran in and said that they, they, they'd heard they heard Bill G. Uh, in a press conference calling it .NET, so they guessed that what it, what, that's what it was named. <laughs> um, and it was my first look at that technology, and, and this was, I mean, this was a couple of years at least before the first version shipped, and I plugged my laptop into you know into a wall jack and took a daily build that was pretty much fully functional, although no help. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't the technology that stood so much that day as what I thought was going to happen to Microsoft's ability to to evolve the technology. Mm. And I think, you know, we uh, 2002 came out, that was the first release. 2003 came out, which in some ways was a bundling of web release and, you know, sort of bits and pieces that didn't make it in the first release. Right, right. But 2005... Um, if you if you look at you know all the pieces, there's some really really exciting stuff. I mean, oh yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, Brad Abrams, um, who uh, works for Microsoft, and he he wrote the uh, uh, the .NET Framework Standard Library Annotated Reference. Um, he did a talk on what's new in the uh, Common Language Runtime 2.0, mm-hmm. um, and I mean they've really been able to to start adding things that are reflections of you know, what customers say that they want. Um, the, the other cool thing, I mean, so, I mean, aside from you know some of the new security and performance stuff, um, pre-compilation options that are available in two O the Common Language Runtime. Mm. Uh, I mean, the, there are dozens of new controls, new data access methodology. Um, not uh, not a new version of ADO.NET, but just smarter tools in Visual Studio.net to assist with, with uh, building data-driven apps. And I know of a couple of people, at least the, in my personal realm of experience locally, who just happen to be VB developers, who <clears throat> who just, have you know, they tried VBNet and they just can't get it, and, you know, the it's too radical of a change for them. So I'm thinking that Widby is going to be their ticket in. You know, it's more like, uh, more like the VB6 experience. So with, I think there's one big sort of, Stop gap in the current versions for for traditional VB programmers, and, and that is that I mean, you know, VB programmers are used to the RAD experience. They're used to using controls. They're used to programming against the events and controls. Um, the library is sort of big, but but the there there, there are two things actually I think that are going to be a big help for for VB programmers that are still looking to really wrap themselves around .NET. One is that. Um, Visual Studio 2005 is a whole lot smarter about helping the developer get connected to a database. So, in fact, you can you can write an application um, that that does database access, input and output, and literally not write one line of code, which just wasn't the case in the first two versions. You really had to you know, do some work on, you know, creating a connection and a data adapter and, right. and, and you know, writing your own access. Um, now that the, the tool is really good at helping you do that. The other thing um, that we as developers tend to underestimate the, the value of is that they've made a collection of improvements to IntelliSense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it, we we really underestimate how how dependent and how 
I mean, oh, how much vital. we we write code and you know without having to commit you know the entire .NET framework to memory. But I had to at a demo. I had to uh, somebody wanted me to write some code in Notepad, and I was really embarrassed at at uh, you know how <laughs> how bad a how how bad a synt- syntasticist I'd become without the aid of IntelliSense. Yeah. Have you seen uh, the the tool that Mark Miller showed us? Uh, yes, last uh, week, Code Rush. I haven't. Oh, you got to see this. Great stuff. It's like IntelliSense on steroids. I'll show it to you next time I see oh, it. Oh, cool. Yeah. Can Can I comment on the Notepad thing real sure. quick? Sure. Yeah. I, yeah. I just wanted to say that I don't think there's really anything to be embarrassed of, right? Because in the old days, you know, if you're going to go in and write a write a C app or something like that, you really didn't have a lot to remember. You know, I mean, you memorize some keywords, you memorize some this, you memorize some that, you figured out where to stick the curly braces and you could run with it. Um, but with .NET, the framework is so enormous that there's no way you're ever going to commit all that stuff to memory. And there's so many uh, dependent technologies you have to deal with. Like, I mean, there's the web config file and, and, uh, or just an app config file, just any configuration files. I mean, just so many things you can add into your project that you'd have right. to keep track of that. I don't think there's anything embarrassing or shameful at all about um, having a tough time writing .NET code with Notepad because there's just too much to know. Well, I so, mean, IntelliSense uh, isn't just a convenience. It's practically a necessity it's now. It's a necessity, yeah. No, no shame, no shame. Well, really, I, I appreciate your support. <laughs> I, 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 I still, uh, I think one of the tough things for us is, you know, for, for guys on our team, Rory and my, my team, is that, you know, we we really need to know, um, you know, the current technology, so the .NET tools, the .NET platform, at least two, probably three languages, right? So C Sharp and VB, we switch back and forth, and, and uh, mm-hmm. a lot of us uh, have to stay up to date with C++, particularly if we work, you know, with the ISV community. And then, you know, the programming model for BizTalk, Content Management Server, SharePoint, um, and we have to know that for three generations of technology. The current one, the last one being Common Win DNA, and then the next one, the 2005 platform. And, and that's the thing I think that makes the job tough. I, I, I was sort of chuckling earlier listening to, uh, to Rory uh, tell tales of some of his first experiences with being uh, of reading his evals from his attendees. And uh, one of the things that just amazes me in this job is how critical people can be about about silly or unrelated things. Mm. Um, you know, I had uh, I had three guys from one company a few weeks ago came in and they they were they sat down front, they were on the edge of their chairs, they had lots of dialogue the whole day, uh, but they scored me straight fives because a third of the session <laughs> of the afternoon was on InfoPath and and they don't like InfoPath. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my my personal favorite one though is um, a mutual friend of ours, Russ Pastino. Oh yeah, uh, who's now down in Florida. Ru- Russ um, and I I personally read this email. Russ had a lady who who scored him very poorly because he had gender bias giveaways at his. Event. <laughs> it's the tool shed. Oh. I swear to God, it was you know Russ's tool shed, and he was giving away you know tools and and tire gauges and stuff and. She was upset that he didn't have, and this is a quote that she that she didn't need a tire gauge. She needed a nail file or a it's hair a lip care gloss product or something, right? She's yeah. the one with the gender bias. <laughs> All right, boys, settle <laughs> down. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> well, anyway, this is a good time to pause, and uh, um, but before we <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before, before we pause crazy. for the break, no, no, that's good stuff. Before we pause for the break, though, we're going to uh, do a segment on the show. A fairly new segment uh, that Kirk Webb brings to the show called The Weird Wide Web. Mr. Kirk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Utterly amazing. Horrible. That is the coolest theme song we have ever done. I, I, I can't get over that. I still love it. <laughs> What's up, man? Uh, nothing, uh, nothing uh, too fantastic. But uh, we have some, we have some pretty good sites. Uh, some very informative sites, actually. Okay. Um, the first one is shrinkster dot com uh, slash n s as in uh, Sam. That's Norman Sam, and it is Britney Spears Guide to Semiconductor Physics. <laughs> It's fantastic. These guys, I, I finally really dug into it, though, and found out that, surprise, it's a spoof. Surprise. Oh, okay. There's these three guys uh, from uh, the University of Essex uh, in, in the UK that uh, basically put all of their notes and homework and labs and everything on here. And you can actually learn about 
you know, crystal growth and and uh, semiconductor and optoelectronics and, and everything. That's cool. And, but on every page, there's like a picture of Britney Spears and says, well, you know, Britney says it's really best if you do it this way. <laughs> and um, little did you know, there was an introduction, actually, he, you know, Hedy Lamar. um was actually Headley, the fir- Headley, Headley, Headley. Headley. Headley was actually the first to really get into this, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's 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 fantastic sites. That's Very cool. Photonic crystals. I like this. Let's photonic, look at that one. <laughs> photonic crystals is good. Um, so she's got a caption of her saying, "Oh yeah, yeah." There's the there it is. The periodic arrangement of ions on a lattice gives rise to the energy band structure in semiconductors. If you go That's back, how it starts, and there's a picture of Brittany. It's awesome. Moving her hair out of her eyes. If you go to the, the homepage and head uh, to oh, where was I? Where was I? <laughs> Back Radio, to uh, radioactive recombination. This is great stuff. It's actually really good if you're <laughs> after, if you're interested in semiconductor physics. It's probably well. I hope I don't really know much about it. Um, if you go to the reference and data page, mm-hmm. and then you go, you get to the uh, Britney Spears lip lip glossary of semiconductor terms. Oh man! Here's where you really get to uh, learn all about this. Uh, acceptor and alloyed semiconductor. All right, this All is right. making my brain hurt. Yeah, this is that's enough of that. <laughs> okay, now for something actually weird, um, okay. which is what all you guys really want. Shrinkster.com forward slash NQ. That's Norman Q. And it is um, <laughs> die screaming with sharp things in your head. Oh, nice. this guy, I believe, as he <laughs> hoods himself on the right there, it's the kids corner with the gnome maker. Ooh. I can see this guy. <laughs> yeah, I can see this guy going from house to house and stealing these yard gnomes and <laughs> impaling right, them so with things. For, for people who aren't looking at this right now, these little yard gnomes with things sticking in their heads and bleeding. Uh, yeah, everything from yard gnomes, scissors, <laughs> axes, uh, protractors, uh, all sorts of things. That's that's my weird. Oh, thing. and they have lots of photos there. All sorts of photos. But but the key is they are all lawn gnomes, like s- dwarfs kind of things. Yeah, gnomes. like this Snow White and the Seven Dwarf kind of. So somebody actually had to say, "Hey, I like gnomes. I like violent, bloody death." <laughs> <laughs> Let me put the two things together. together. You can actually buy uh, swag at the bottom there too. Oh my god, that is and weird. surprise, Cafe Press. That's too weird. Uh, and my last and. Um, Jeez. This one's actually pretty funny because I actually could spend a really good amount of time on this every day. Is shrinkster.com forward slash NT, which is badcookie.com. Ooh. Um, basically, Ooh. it's a. Um, click uh, on the cookie to click receive on the cor- a fortune. And it's a, it's a randomly generated. Um, actually, all of a sudden, this thing got really slow. Randomly uh, <laughs> generated <laughs> angry oh, <wow>. fortune. <laughs> you will never step on the soil of other countries. Your spirit of adventure will be deadly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a good time to take that. Oh, it's a good time to pull the plug on life support for that daughter you've been keeping alive for the past six months. Do Ouch. not reach for your money purse in public. <laughs> you have no outstanding traits. <laughs> Simplicity and boredom are themes. Are your themes in dress? <laughs> Eat. All right. All right. So That's, yeah, it's pretty boring. I think my favorite still is Britney Spears. And, uh, uh, well, semiconductor physics, of course. And that that will wrap it up, or you got any more? Oh, no, uh, that's, that's that's more than enough. More than enough for now. <laughs> Thanks, Kirk. You bet. Utterly amazing. Horrible. Oh no! That is the Weird Wide Web with Kirk Webb. That's two Bs, Weird Wide Web. Yes, isn't that clever? Oh, now yeah, I get it. Yeah, now you get it. And uh, stick around. We're going to uh, play some music and pay some bills and uh, have some fun. So we're going to listen to this first one here by Mr. Rory Blythe. And uh, what's this one called, Rory? First Song. Yeah, First Song. <laughs> so what's it called? We just have stupid names. <laughs> first Song. <laughs> Rory Blythe, please.
heard me talk many times about our friends up at Data Dynamics. They, uh, they have great tools and they have risen to the challenge of supporting .NET Rocks through thick and thin. Uh, they do a lot with community involvement in general and, uh, and they've been a great supporter of ours. They're supporting the movie. They're sponsoring the .NET Rocks movie which is going to be out later this fall. And uh, they have great tools and the reason that we got together with them we actually contacted them because we love ActiveReports.net and we thought it would make a great uh, sponsorship relationship. As it turns out, uh, a lot of the regional directors also use ActiveReports.net and love it. And a lot of the MVPs also use ActiveReports.net. And I was finding in my classes when we were talking about reporting, anytime anybody would ask, you know, what should I use for reports? Should I use the crystal stuff? You know, somebody else in the class would say, no, use ActiveReports.net. We've used that. We love it. Uh, so... It's not an enterprise reporting solution like uh, SQL reporting services or Crystal Enterprise. 
It's a report generator where you compile the reports as uh, design surfaces that can take other .NET applications. I'm sorry, other .NET controls. On you know, put them right onto the report and compile the report right into your application. Generates PDF, HTML. Works with ASP.NET as well. It's good stuff. Check them out at dot dot www.datadynamics.com So anyway, um, let's uh, before we bring back Joe Stagner, Rory, you uh, have some stuff for the Ask Rory segment, which we've been uh, we've been doing. We're you know we're going to come up with a, a page on the site that has a, like a list of all the segments and what they are. Uh, we need to get yeah. a little bit better organized about that. But but this segment is great. This is Ask Rory. Any questions that you might have about love, romance, technology, jobs, uh, anything at all that's on your mind, send your questions to Rory at Neopolian.com and he will answer them on the show during this segment. What's up? What's up? Okay. So the, the first Ask Ray I got this week, I love this one. Um, it's very, very short and I have no idea how to answer it. Um, it stands on its own. This is unanswerable. It just says, it's from a guy named Tobek. It just says, a short question. Are data sets the new variants? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I don't, I don't know what to say to that. Um, I don't think I'm allowed to comment on that. <laughs> so, uh, the next one, um, this one comes from a guy named uh, it, Lokesha. No <laughs> yeah, well, I can't answer that. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how to answer that. It, it was it was too clever. It was too brilliant. Yeah. So the next one comes from comes from this guy named uh, Lokesha. He says, "Hi, I'm developing an application in VBNet where in a single form I have nine tabs." The lines of code is exceeding 8,000 lines, and I have to take care of those by splitting them into classes in terms of functionality. That's always a good idea. Um, but it is still exceeding in terms of lines of code. Uh, these lines mm-hmm. of code are mainly because of using the data grid and when a user is going in to add remove data to the data grid. I'm mm. worried about the speed that this may cause. Mm. He says, please help me in this issue so that I can increase the speed of my application and I should be able to reduce the number of lines of code. Mm. Okay, so I have, I have three... Ideas for you here, okay? Now, the first idea, and this might not be the easiest thing, okay, is to convert the entire application to C sharp and just have no line breaks. Just have semicolons <laughs> dividing the different lines, okay? Because you can do that. So you can cut those 8,000 lines down to one line if you do it that way. So that's, that's my first route, okay? You could actually do the that in VB is with that colons, too, you know? VB can oh, that's separate right. lines of, of code Of course, yeah. You don't even yeah. need to convert to C sharp. That was such a cumbersome... Uh, uh, solution, yeah, Carl, but you were totally not? right. Um, <laughs> why not? Locash- yeah, sure, you know, why not? But if you don't want to, just put the colons between the lines <laughs> He's and just make it all in one line, right okay? <laughs> so, so that's easier. Yeah. Um, the next thing you can do, uh, if speed is really your number one concern, is, uh, you know, get a faster computer, right? Okay, <laughs> Duh. So the next thing, item number three, yeah. is that if you're really worried about having too many lines of code and things going faster, then what I want you to do right now is this, okay? Open up Visual Studio, load up your solution, okay? Now what you should see is you should see your solution, the project, and a list of files. Right-click on some of those files and then select delete or remove, <laughs> okay? You'll find that the total lines of code in your project will go down dramatically mm. as you begin <laughs> deleting files in your project, all right? And eventually, you will have very, very few lines altogether and your application should run very quickly indeed. Okay, so I, I hope that helps you out there. This guy's writing a manifesto as we speak. You're, you're going to be like marked for death or something. <laughs> well, it wouldn't be the uh, first time. Yeah, so right. the next one is uh, from, from uh, I'm not sure it's from Shannon or Tanya or Shannon and Tanya, but uh, okay. the, the name in the from field simply says Shannon and Tanya. Oh. So there are a couple questions here. Uh, we have, my 18-month-old daughter doesn't seem to understand that she has two grandmothers. I tried to explain to her that grandmother is like a class, and that she has two instances of the grandmother class <laughs> as Grandma D and Grandma Ann, but I, can't, but I can tell she just doesn't get it. Do you know of any Elmo DVDs concerning such subject matter? Uh, what I can say... Uh, is that although I'm not familiar with any Elmo DVDs, I think your whole approach is all wrong, okay? Your 18-month daughter is not going to understand the problem in terms of, you know, some <laughs> academic weird coding explanation, all right? What she will understand is if you withhold her meals, all right? So my recommendation to you 
<laughs> it's to simply not feed her until she at least pretends that she gets it. And after a while, whether, whether she gets it or not, she'll be living the lie and she'll start to believe it. Okay. So uh, that's exactly how I do it, right? I mean, I don't have any kids myself, so I don't know if this is the best really? child psychology, but that's my idea. Um, finally, uh, the last Hold question head from the Shannon and Tanya yeah. is, I want a prehensile tail. And for anybody who doesn't know, um, prehensile means that this tail would have the ability to grasp things, kind mm-hmm. of like your hands, okay? Mm-hmm. My question is whether or not there are existing nerve endings that could control such an appendage if one so chose to have a prehensile tail attached. After all, I don't want a tail attached unless I can get some use out of it. That would just be ridiculous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Shannon and Tanya, the answer to your question is uh, you're a freak. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the Ask Rory for the week. Um, remember to send in your questions next week. So thank you, everybody. Send those questions to Rory at neapolian.com. And uh, thank you very much. And we're back with Joe Stagner from Microsoft, and we were talking about all sorts of great stuff, about the uh, Java community, about uh, .NET, about JBuilder, about uh, open source. What haven't we talked about? I, I just can't think about anything after uh, Ask Rory. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> well, I, I mean, <laughs> I, Comic value aside, I'm I'm sort of worried about my reputation inside Microsoft. That you know, as he mentioned, I you know he interviewed with me, and I recommended we hire him. How about his reputation? Now I'm thinking, holy smokes! <laughs> um, I, actually, it was in the at the beginning of the show. Somebody was you were reading about somebody who was asking for a show about you know how to how to get a job at, at Microsoft, and right. um, I, I was thinking that. Uh, you know, b- before you do that, you may want to have, you know, people that think they might want to come work for Microsoft actually just ping Rory and have him describe <laughs> what we put him through. Yeah, I told him to uh, put up a blog and swear a lot, you know. Right the bleeding the- stopped. <laughs> oh, we, but, <laughs> so we worked, we worked Rory over really good. Oh, yeah, really? Is that Does that explain why he wasn't funny last week? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just because he, he's now you know he's in his he, he's in his uh, you know the gentle period where that right. you know, when you first start at Microsoft it's like trying to take a drink of water from an open fire hydrant. Yeah, but just the interview process was because <laughs> he interviewed with me and me and Mike O'Neill double teamed him. Yeah, and Mike of course is our boss, and and he and I have equally abusive personalities. <laughs> um, but but just when he thought he was out of the woods, we put him in a room with about a third of our team and. Let him do a fifteen-minute presentation. Yeah, and we just. Uh, well, I sort of have this theory that that Rory's going to infect Microsoft, and he's going to change him. You think? Yeah, I think so. Like leprosy. You, you want to know my? <laughs> you want to know my personal uh, my personal prediction about about Rory and Microsoft? Sure. Okay, R- Rory, don't listen for a minute. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> Jeff, what, mute Rory. No. Yeah, no. <laughs> when. Uh, when his boss told me that he was going to hire him, I, I, t- I told his boss that I thought Rory was either going to disappear in five months or he was going to be an absolute superstar. <laughs> One or the other. <laughs> no middle ground. He doesn't do anything half-assed, that's for sure. Well, Microsoft does that to, to people anyway, right? I mean, you know, we, we uh, you know, there, there's like, I don't know, some huge percentage that don't make it past the first year. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I, uh, you know, I know we're talking about him, and he's here and listening, and and it's kind of weird for him and all that stuff. But you know, his life, whole life is kind of weird if you think about it. So he should be able to deal with it. Um, I, I actually think he's going to be one of the one of the better presenter presenters at at Microsoft as soon as he finds his rhythm. Just like Mark Miller said, you know, send him out into the uh, into the desert with a laptop and some peyote, and he'll come back and change the world. He sort of has that. Uh, quality about it. I checked. I can't expense peyote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's, it, I mean, it's, I don't think it, it's the uh, the presentation part or the technical part that'll be a challenge for Rory. It's just that he's been this sort of, you know, solo road warrior. Lone right. wolf kind of thing, yeah. For, for right. so long that, you know, working for the Empire, you know, <laughs> there's paperwork and stuff. Well, how's it been, Rory? I mean, are you, is it, it's, you said, you're saying it's like the best job you've I, ever I'm had. actually, I am really, really loving it. It's, it's, I, the job description sounded good when I read it, but it's like every single day I find out one more thing that I had no idea uh, was going to be included. And the paperwork actually isn't so bad because as that lone road warrior, I had to like do tons of taxes. I had to 
I mean, I actually had to, Rory had to turn off the crazy switch and deal with the IRS, you know? Ooh. I mean, when you're dealing with the IRS, they don't have a sense of humor. Nobody at the IRS has a sense of humor, and you have to, you have to actually be sane for a few minutes and, and deal with that. So I, was, I, I can understand where the people at Microsoft would have been worried about me calming down and, and uh, doing the things I had to do. But I think as far as the basic job responsibilities go, I'm not going to have a problem at all. I'm already looking for... Um, extra ways I can I can help out and, well, and we've already add heard, to my load because I'm having heard, a really good time. It really is fun. We've already heard good things about your uh, your presentation, so <laughs> I'm sure it's uh, just going to get better and better and better and better and better. So Rory, I got a challenge. Ready? I got a challenge for you. Okay. Um, Carl was uh, Carl was uh, asking earlier about uh, getting a, a copy of uh, Visual Studio for a, uh, a listener. So right. my challenge for you as you're learning to navigate the vast internal plumbing of Microsoft is um, uh, <laughs> give you a week see if you can come up with a copy of Visual Studio for, for this guy if you can't I will provide one All right. if you can I will add SQL Server Developer Edition to the mix oh wow see what you get for just for listening to I will, defi- I will definitely show. find it man that's very now very let nice me ask you something Joe does, does this do purchases from the uh, employee store account no no, it doesn't count if you pay for it out of your own pocket, Rory. <laughs> good, good question. Yeah, well, I don't care. You know, I mean, I want to win. This isn't about this isn't about saving money. This is about you know just <laughs> winning. So Richard Thomas, that's fine. The guy, no, I will find a way to get a copy of Visual Studio. Richard Thomas, the guy who actually asked for it, will be very happy to know that uh, that come hell or high water, he's going to get a copy of that. I envy him. Uh, you know, being a, a stay at home dad, I've, I you know when my wife, you know, we we have two. Uh, Two under two at home, and right. my wife was an executive with Easter Seals before the babies came. But we, they had the first one had some problems getting started, so no daycare would take her, and, and Jill had to uh, had to leave Easter Seals for a while. And when she's having a particularly tough day, I, I tell her, you know, I could, I'll sway, I'll trade places with you. I'd be, I'll be Mister Mom, and I'll write code at night. And so I'm, I was listening to to his letter and being a little envious. Yeah. It certainly is a, a tall order when you have to, you know, they, because kids change your brain. I mean, they they bring you down to a more fundamental level, you know, that uh, you're not used to thinking at that level. And it's almost kind of like jarring, you know, oh, yeah, I got to go down here for a while. And then you come back. But it's also, I mean, it's also amazing. I mean, you know, oh, I, was, totally. I was single most of my adult life. And, and uh, you know, I, my friends from, you know, my old friends think it's hysterical that you know now that now that I'm a dad again and you know that I uh, you know I, I don't know when I get paid or how much money I make and it all just goes right into my wife's bank account for you know, long term. <laughs> Your and, wallet is a buffer. No, it doesn't even go through my wallet. She's smarter oh, than that. Direct deposit. <laughs> I love it. Uh, she says a, a fairly big chunk goes to Amazon.com. Uh huh. But uh, <laughs> well, uh, hey Joe. Go ahead. I got the copy of Visual Studio. Already? You probably bought yeah. it. <laughs> no, I didn't buy it. I swear I didn't buy it. I will divulge everything, but um, you, you the, asked Jim the copy is already coming. Awesome. All right. I, I asked him to teach me how to do it. This uh, is how you're resourceful in Microsoft, right? You have to find the person who knows how to do it. So, uh, so, so, so Carl, not only will I, I guess because of because Rory rose to the challenge and was, was so blazingly fast. Within five minutes. Um not only, uh, and I'll send it to you to, to bundle and, and pass along, but, okay. uh, but I'll, I'll send a copy of SQL, uh, SQL Server Developer, and I'll also send a copy of Visual Studio Tools for Office. And My Richard, pleasure. Oh, sweet. Oh, that's so great of you, Joe. Thanks. Richard would be very happy. And, and, uh, and I might even be able to come up with some other .NET swag. Awesome. We're all about swag. <clears throat> and we're going to send you some .NET Rock swag, so go to... Uh, our useless crap website at cafepress.com slash dotnet rocks Joe and pick out some okay. pick out anything you want I will do we'll send it the to lunch you. boxes <laughs> lunch boxes the cheapest piece of shit you've ever Primo. seen in your yeah, life just don't but it's great open it or try to close yeah. it but <laughs> it won't stay closed for anything but <laughs> hey Rory were you, were you on the team when um, when T-Rex went live and um, what's I T-Rex? kind of was. That's that's uh, T Rex is this uh, application that we have where we're supposed to be uh, putting in our numbers from the shows, like how many people we had show up and how oh, many okay. people were registered and things like that. Um, 
Yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I think I might have been there when it went live. I know I was there when things were switching and people were a little bit confused because I've seen a lot of questions on the SST mailing list about that. So T-Rex is this sort of monster application that is all about our events management. Um, and, and there's going to be some cool stuff that comes out of, um, out of T-Rex. I've used, I've done a bunch of, one of the things about, um, about our team is that, um, all of the, all of the developer community champions are required to write code that is used in production inside Microsoft. Right? Cause, cause one of the things that sort of, a, you know, when you, when you present for a living, you know, the first year that you come out of the real world and you, and you start speaking to developers, you know, you know your stuff and, you know, in the second year you're pretty good, and by the third year you you know you suck because you you don't write code anymore. So our team is required <laughs> to continue to write applications that are actually deployed in production inside Microsoft. So I've I've been doing a bunch of SQL reporting services stuff for management uh, against uh, against uh, T Rex, and and I'm I'm working on a custom control um, that that I'm going to try and get you to field test for me, Carl, because you how it will work is you'll drop it on uh, on a page on your website. And you give it a couple of parameters. Yeah, like, I'm all about draggy droppy stuff. So, you know, that's <laughs> well, what I do. That's how this is going <laughs> to work. It's going to be a, I'm going to drop a book droppy. into your lap, Carl. Yeah. It'll, be a, <laughs> it, it, it'll be a custom control that you'll drop on your website and you'll tell how many events you want to return and what type. So it'll be, in your case, MSDN. Okay. And, and which Microsoft business region, like New England, hmm. um, and, and it'll automatically show you the next. Four or four or five events. That's perfect. Uh, from for that are, are targeted at Microsoft developers. Yeah, it's perfect because we've been listing the events and I've just been editing them every week. So right, and that's well, you know, it's such a such a pain, a lot of work. Yeah. Um, but but anyway, and you were talking about lunch boxes and and our uh, my team's marketing budget got cut this year, as did most of the marketing budgets at Microsoft. And I was laughing because uh, just about the time T Rex went live, we got these these like second grade. Lunch boxes with with thermos and such. Wow! Uh, with, that were T Rex and oh uh, boy! I just so we have another original idea at .NET Rocks. I was just oh. reminded why I don't make <laughs> management decisions. So can, if we don't, if you don't mind, we could talk about some .NET stuff now. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's par for the course for this show. I mean, we've talked about far, flying cars for an hour and. Water cooled PCs and all sorts of other crap. But anyway, uh, there was something in your <laughs> list of topics. <laughs> yeah, it's a technical term. There was some other things in your list of topics that interested me. For example, security. And I know for a fact that you did one of the most m- most popular sessions at TechEd, or maybe it was the most popular one of them about hacking. And it was what was it called? How hackers think or how hackers hack? How hackers hack? Yeah, it was the. Uh it was uh, one of the top-rated sessions and the second highest attended breakout at TechEd. So tell me about it. Um, well, so Microsoft's been doing a lot of security stuff, and, and we've done a lot of stuff for developers. Um, we're doing a lot of webcasts, but um, we start with content that, from my perspective, is is a little academic um, in nature. So I um, I started with, uh, I, I rewrote all the demos to be sort of, you know, Real life hacks, not not irresponsibly disclosing techniques so much as you know, really showing the kinds of things that a hacker might do, and and starting with how they pick away at a website to start to find a, a door to try and squeeze themselves through. Right. Uh, and, and in fact, that's been so popular that um, I, I just this week um, uh, sealed a, a deal with uh, um, with one of the corporate groups out in Redmond that I'm going to do. A, uh, a security black belt um, series. Uh, so, you know, uh, awesome. ha- how hackers hack and writing secure code for developers um, every Friday starting in January. What were some of the, the techniques you exposed? Um, well, so, so one of the, the, the first thing that a hacker generally does is, is they'll come up to your website, see what the file extensions are, so they can take a guess as to, as to at least what general area of technology you're using. Um, usually, if I were going to hack a, hack a website, not that I ever do this anymore. No, but, of course or not. Not that I ever did this, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Whoa, we'll edit that one out. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, you, you, uh, right after we send the MP3 to your boss. And, uh, <laughs> um, you go to Netcraft and, and get some more information about the server, and, and then you go and, and try and break the server. Right. You do things like um, ask for pay 
pages that aren't there, past too many uh, parameters or, you know, sort of unexpected values. Try um, to overrun the buffer. Well, not just overrun the buffer, um, but just to see. So, I mean, if you can find a buffer overrun, you know, certainly that's one opportunity for, for a hack attack. But more commonly, you'll put weird values or, um, uh, or past parameters that are unexpected not because you're looking for a buffer overrun so much as you're looking to see what sort of diagnostic information the web server will provide when the app fails oh. or crashes. Oh, that's interesting. So you want to get the error message to show, like, lo- this particular line of code, here it is, <laughs> failed. Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of, you'd be, you'd be staggered to know how frequently, by intentionally breaking uh, a web app, you can find um, the name of the database server inside the, you know, inside their network, um, yeah. or, you know, any, any collection of information. Um, so that's, you know, that, that's one way. Um, another way is, uh, to, uh, take, um, forms that are submitted that sort of would be expected to do database access, like a login form, for example, um, mm-hmm. saving that form to disk. So in, you know, in the, in the browser, you know, View source or or save as, um, and seeing if there are hidden values, can you can you change them? Mm. Um, and you know, right. So both to submit against the database to look for SQL injection opportunities, and and I mean, you know, a lot of developers when they when you show them SQL injection attacks, they they go, oh yeah, well that's simple, and you know, I would never do that. But right. um, you know, before Microsoft, I did a fair bit of security work, and you'd be amazed at the number of of uh, applications that don't have sufficient um, SQL injection protection. A lot of people think it's just you know, the ability to add commands, you know, add additional mm-hmm. commands to a SQL string. Right. Um, but, but there are a lot of other ways that um, that you can play with what gets past the SQL server. Anything that makes a SQL server uh, parser ch- uh, switch context can mm-hmm. be an opportunity for breach. <clears throat> now, I had a guy in my class once who claimed that he could cause a SQL injection attack using parameters. And, um, and I said, I'd like to see you try, and he couldn't. He couldn't reproduce it, but he says he had seen it done. Well, so it, it depends on... And I guess what I'm... Let's qualify this. What I'm talking about is, uh, for, you know, we've talked about SQL injection attacks on the show before, and if, if, you, haven't, if you have a website up and you haven't heard what this is, just Google it and you're going to be scared. Uh, basically people who type in um, passwords and email addresses uh, on the website and then on the back end you concatenate a SQL string together with that input. You're allowing somebody to type in, you know, to close off the SQL executable uh, string and type more SQL commands and take over your machine and do nasty things. So, um, but if you use parameters and you use that input in a parameter, that's, that's step number one to uh, safeguard yourself. But this guy was saying that he could actually, uh, oh, you know, hack a site that was using an input parameter with a SQL injection attack, and I just thought... Well, so I don't, I don't know if he could, but I can. I can. Uh-oh. Um, and it depends. So, I mean, using parameterized queries gives you... Uh, you gain a lot of ground um, in protecting yourself against SQL injection attacks. But... Um, but you depending on the that. database and what the field types are, there are still things that you can. There are still ways that you can attempt to inject code, even though they're that you're using parameterized. Not attempt, that. like you know, it's possible. Um, yes, it, it, it's it's possible. You don't necessarily get the same. Um, so you, you're not necessarily going to execute code, right? But but there are lots of different um, sort of false data uh, attacks. Like for for instance, the um, uh, there, I, there was a um, an application that hit the news a little while ago, uh, a, a car dealership that took orders online, and um, uh, the hacker was able to figure out how to um, overflow the value of a floating point number so that when he placed his order, he was able to charge himself a negative number for the price of the car that he was oh, ordering. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and this, I guess that this actually, like, there was a... <laughs> so, was a, it, did it credit his Visa card or something? What's that? Did it credit his Visa card or something? Well, I guess there was, <laughs> there was a car on a truck when the accounting department wondered why they were sending him this big fat check to go along with his car. <laughs> <laughs> 
nice. All right, now that's beautiful. I mean, I don't condone hacking, but when you hear stuff like that, that's just like, you know, <laughs> yay. That's so freaking cool. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess not. Not cool if you're you not know. cool if you're the car dealer, but of course, or the developer of that set. <clears throat> but you know what? You know, if if you did something like that, you'd be an idiot to keep it. I mean, I, I would if if I could do that, I would do it and then deliver the check back and tell them how to fix their stuff and just just for the victory of being able to. Uh, yeah, you you've got roots though, but you know, for a young single guy like Rory, you'd take the check in the car to Mexico. <laughs> yeah, that's what. That's exactly what I was thinking. I was like, "Are you kidding me? <laughs> what are you get nuts? a check in a car?" And give it back. <laughs> <laughs> or you know, or you know, Corey's a little. Corey's ambitious. After it worked the first time, he'd ordered six or eight more cars. Yeah. <laughs> there you so, go. Give it. Back. So yeah, there's um, there, there's all kinds of uh, tricky little games, and the tough thing is that you know, I mean, I, I think lots of folks sort of think they have their head around writing secure code, but but really don't. Um, and it's it's not because they can; it's because you really need to, you know, I, I used to work in, in uh, law enforcement technology and, and to, to really write code that is defensive, you really have to learn to think like the bad guy. Um, and, you know, learning how hackers actually do what they do requires a fairly significant time investment. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, and so, so that's why. Yeah, so that's how you know so much about this stuff. Actually... You know, a lot of a lot of programmers started out hacking. I mean, it's how you teach yourself. You know, you you hack around things and you try to find workarounds for stuff when you don't have the documentation and or the documentation sucks and you know you just have what you have and you try to be resourceful. Um, but anyway, uh, so what what were some of the other interesting uh, things that came out of that session? I know there was a lot of material that you covered. Um, what else do we? Uh, we uh, we uh, I pretty liberally talked about um, cross-site scripting attacks. Right. Um, cross-site scripting attacks are sort of, you know, the new, there's this genre of hacker called script kitty. Right, script kids. Yeah. Right, and, and, and these folks are like not the kind of developer who would figure out how to locate and leverage a buffer overflow, for example. Right. Um, but but uh, cross-site scripting is one of a whole collection of ways that are getting more and more popular to trick a website um, um, into doing, you know, anything from, you know, surrendering somebody else's username and password to letting you, you know, um, put a bunch of stuff in your shopping cart and then get it for free. Right. Um, <clears throat> and it's sort of also the source of pop-up mania, isn't it? Cross-site scripting? Um, sort of like installing little scripts that pop things up and change what's on the screen and like I went to I went to access my blog once and like all the all the links that I had put in there had been changed to links to porn sites yeah well the the, the, the porn the, the online pornsters are are really good at you know using pop-ups and you know all sorts of little JavaScript tricks to try and keep right. you looking at something you've told them you don't want to look at or, yeah. or you know um, but the, the the kinds of the, the kinds of cross-site scripting stuff that that I was looking at in my sessions and I'm going to look at you know this winter are you know around data theft, identity theft, um, and uh, you know, theft of products and services. And it, wow. it, it's scary the kinds of things that, that that are really simple to do. Things like um, you know you ever you ever cut and paste a username and password or password. Did you yeah, know that's that that good. stays that that that, that stays, stays in, in your clipboard? And right. I can write a little piece of JavaScript that you never see that will take whatever's on your clipboard when you hit my page and forward it to someplace else. That's insane. And, and there's all kinds of little you know little tricks like that that are dependent on um, there's a there's a hacker's technique called phishing, mm -hmm. um, which is basically you know sort of broad reach, just you know you know email a million people. Because if you can get a thousand of them to do what you want them to do, that's a pretty good, you know, return on the hacker's investment. Yeah. So if you can get, a, you know, if you can get a thousand of that, you know, million to go to the hacker's website, you know, um, you know, cross-site scripting attack, for example, might let somebody steal your login credentials or an open session, you know, for your email, where they can you know, then request, you know, username and password for 
sites that you're likely to be a member of, like Amazon.com, for example. Right. Have you uh, have you installed and do you use Service Pack Two yet? XP Service Pack Two. I, I do, and, it, and it's funny that uh, at Microsoft we have a um, you know we have this eat your own dog food sort of cultural mantra. Um, so I'm I'm always uh, you know early on, on the betas, and I resisted um, installing XP uh, SP Two until uh, Windows Update uh, started mm-hmm. to start to ask me for it. Mm-hmm. Um, just because uh, things have been so busy for me this summer, and there's been all, there was so much sort of dialogue about problems that, X, that SP2 um, had solved. And um, I've installed it on, you, you know, you've, you've seen my lab. I've got about 40 machines in here, and I've, right. I've installed it on at least half of them, um, not had anything break, hmm. um, really had no uh, really had no problems. The only thing is it, it does, when you, when, when you install it, there is a sort of a period of adjustment where you train the firewall which applications are allowed to have you know, yeah. inbound or outbound conversations. But if you've used things like uh, Norton's Internet Security, you know, you've been doing that anyway. I, I use Norton's on some of my machines and Zone Alarm on, on some of them, and you know, <clears throat> they, they all do that sort of same, you know, when a, when a request from an application that it's not already configured to allow wants to, um, wants to make a call out through the Internet, you have to, you know, it asks you whether or not to give it permission. So. I really feel bad for the people who uh, who know about as much as uh, about PCs as they do refrigerators or their cars. And I have a friend who trades stocks, and he's <laughs> he's not only PC stupid, but he's PC phobic. And he uses the computer because he has to. And uh, he has absolutely he has a resistance to learning anything. He'll call me and ask me what something is. And I'll tell him, point blank, in the plainest English that I can possibly muster. And he'll say, yeah, I'll never understand that. I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. I'm, I'm just, no, there's no way I'm going to remember any of that. Uh, you know, like this built-in blockage of, you know, of, of trying to learn anything. And and he pressed the yes button when asked if he wanted to update his XP computer. And he's, he's f***ed. <laughs> it's basically, you know, he is calling me all the time for for support. You know, what does this mean? What does that mean? <clears throat> I can't even uh, like remote desktop to him to fix it for him because it's all firewalled, and uh, so he's going to have to like bring his computer either to me or to somebody else to to sort of sort things out for him. And uh, but you know, if people if people computer users want to forget about developers. I mean, your your average user wants to uh you know is is looking forward to a nice easy you know free ride it's just uh i don't don't know we're moving away from that with security security just requires that we be a little bit smarter about how things work well so i mean that's really the big challenge that microsoft has with security yeah i I mean at, at least from a consumer's perspective and if you think about it you know i've always sort of had this this thought that as as we, we meaning the industry, not just Microsoft, as we move it more into computers focused at the consumer. Yeah. Um, so think, think about the difference between, you know, cars today and cars, you know, 30 years ago. So when I was in high school, every boy took auto shop because if you were going to own a car, you were going to have to know something about auto mechanics to keep it on the road. Um, my son... Um, I, from my my son from my first marriage a few years ago graduated from the same high school that I went to and they don't even teach auto shop there anymore. Yeah. Right. So that now the, the the automotive engineering has advanced to the point where you just get in the car and you go and and uh, that's really where computers need to get to to have the same consumer penetration. <clears throat> right. I mean, we, we at some get, point the computer has to authorize whether this application is going to accept or or reject and you know. How's that going to get easier? Well, so, so I I challenge you to to think a little bit, sort of. Don't think linearly in terms right. of how we've addressed security problems sure. to date. Sure. And sort of leap leapfrog a little bit. You Bring know, it up to a higher level for the user, in other words. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the user has to, you know, we we need a we need to evolve the technologies so that it's it's virtually impossible for. Um, for a foreign website or a, or, a, or a piece of software to to do things 
that are malicious, or, or at least within you know certain logical confines. Um, and, and obviously, I mean, I, I don't have the details worked out. If I if I did, yeah, right, sure, you know, I'd be in charge, right. Um, but but I think that's that's got to be where the goal is, and and that's a you know apart from all of the work that Microsoft is doing around security and trustworthy computing um, to you know to win and hold the trust of the developer and the enterprise. That's just just in the you know in the consumer space. My my dad falls in that same bucket, right? My, right. My, my father is a is a financial genius. Um, but he's, uh, he's standing in front of the microwave going, come on. Oh, he's, he's had a VCR for 25 years. He still calls me when he wants to record a program. <laughs> My right. mother's VCR is still flashing midnight. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, I, I, I'm hoping to, uh, um, to write as much of the content for that, uh, for the, the black belt series myself. That's good. Uh, so yeah. Well, I hope you can have uh, some influence in the security team. I don't know if you uh, if you do have any interaction with the people who are working on security. So I I, I do. I've got a, um uh, I, I'm doing a bunch of of work with um, the the BMO, which is the the broad marketing organization around the kinds of things we need to be doing for security. I have a I have a great relationship with uh, the ASP.NET team um, and communicate with guys like Brian Goldfarb and Sean Nandy regularly. Um, right. and, and actually, one of the coolest things about going to BorCon for me was that um, they were uh, the SQL Server team was previewing the SQL 2005 Beta 2 resource kit. So uh, Matt Nunn and Ewan Garden and, and Don Farmer were there for the whole week. Um, and I got to, to really do a lot of sort of brainstorming with them about how we can take uh, what's new in SQL 2005 um, from a security perspective, but but all the other angles as well, and and get that information in front of the developer community um, yeah. in a in a more effective way than just the broad air cover marketing stuff. Yeah. MSDE, by the way, uh, here, you guys talking about MSDE? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, MSDE is actually limited to eight. Um, Worker instances, which I'm told are not exactly the same as processes, um, but but it's all a moot point because all of that goes away because nobody can nobody's ever figured out. Even the guys in the SQL team tell me they haven't figured out how to actually explain it concisely. Okay. So when 2005 ships, there'll be two, uh, SQL 2005 Express. It won't have any performance throttling on it. Right. The only the only uh, instance throttling though, right? Yeah. Like I only have 16 or something like that instances running on one machine. Um, so according to the SQL team, uh, the, the only restrictions are it, uh, it's restricted to uh, one processor on a box, four gigabyte yeah. disk file size, and one gigabyte of one gigabyte of RAM. And, and we'll only use one gig of RAM, or if you have more than one, it won't work. It will only use one gig of RAM. Okay. And that's uh, and it will come with some flavor of of uh, administration tools, not the not the uh, not the workbench that will come with the, the full blown product, um, and there are no licensing fees. So, Joe, do you have any? Uh, we're, we're sort of coming down to the wire here. Do you have any uh, calls to action uh, for the listeners, or last minute words of advice, or anything else that you want to say as a uh, uh, final thoughts? Um, so, I, I guess a couple of things. Uh, MSDNEvents.com dot com is my team's is my team's portal for all events that guys like Rory and myself uh, do all around the country. Mm-hmm. Um, my code is uh, my um, my website is managedcode.com, and uh, come to an event. Get your hands on the beta. We're uh, for the next couple of months. We'll be giving out the Visual Studio 2005 beta on our events DVDs. All right. And uh, uh, the uh, there's also ahead. something else on those event DVDs that that I th- I think our listeners might be interested in. Uh, yes, we've we've uh, uh, for for our MSDN events attendees, we've. Uh, We've removed the necessity for them to uh, download .NET Rocks and, and burn it to their own disks. We're doing it for them. Yeah, all the shows, the entire archive. Well, actually, you're staggering them, right? Yeah, yeah. What, what, that we're, fit? <laughs> what, what we're doing is we're we're putting the uh, the event content and, and whatever beta software, and then with whatever space we've got left, we're adding .NET Rocks episodes. That's very cool. Thank you for that. Uh, Kimberly Tripp is listening to the show. She says 16 instances on Express, web-based admin tools, 50 instances on other releases of SQL 2005, 
four gig max database size. There you go. So, uh, uh, um, Joe, stick around because we're going to invite you to hang out in while we do the Toy Boy segment with Richard Campbell from Kuala Lumpur. And this uh, segment is called Richard the Toy Boy. Richard was not uh, on the show last week because he was in Kuala Lumpur, and he's still in Malaysia, but uh, at least this time he uh, is able to connect through the magic of the internet and the uh, Audio TX software that we use. And uh, Richard picks a, a very cool toy and a not so cool toy every week and uh, lays them on us. And uh, we're, I can't wait to hear what he's got for us this week. How are you, Richard? I'm good, buddy. Kuala Lumpur is a fa- fabulous place. Cool. And it's, uh, it's early in the morning here. I'm 12 hours time difference from you. Mm-hmm. I brought all my uh, studio equipment along to get everything work together. But it's, great. I discovered at the last minute when I was setting up that... Uh, the power supply for my digitizer, the thing that hooks the microphone to the computer, was only 110 volts. So it was a scramble Ouch. to find some way to plug this in. And uh, Tim Huckabee came to my rescue first with a little transformer that was supposed to convert the power back down to 110. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, for some reason, that transformer didn't work. Uh-oh. And uh, I couldn't plug it in properly. So I uh, then Kim Tripp came to my rescue not uh, an hour ago with another transformer. Only this one only had a European plug on it. So I had to use Tim's transformer to convert the plug from European to uh, to uh, KL, and I also needed an adapter. So I now have four boxes plugged into <laughs> this outlet coming out to this transformer, and I'm holding it up by bracing it with a chair. So I <laughs> photographed it. I'll throw it up on my classic, blog at some point. Dude, classic. Well, I I told you I I am you. I said, dude, it's serious Rube Goldberg over here. This is what's <laughs> happening. I'm making it work, but it's not easy. Kuala Lumpur, if you've never been, you got to come here. It's fabulous, especially if you're a toy boy. I just blogged an entry for a place I went last night that is a six-story high mall that has only got geek toys in it. Nothing else. Oh, wow. Okay? Hmm. Fry's has nothing on this place. You've never seen anything like it. So I threw it up on my blog. If you want to take a look, it's on shrinkster.com slash O is an Oscar 3. Cool. We'll have to They've check got that out. Billboard size posters of hard drives. Oh my god! Right? I mean, where else do you see advertising for hard drives? It's fantastic. You've never seen anything like it. Wow! And I was searching for the worst toy I could find, and I was trying to explain to the Malaysians what bad toys are, and they didn't really <laughs> understand. I said, "Hello Kitty USB key is a bad toy." <laughs> and they said, "Oh, you want one of those?" <laughs> <laughs> By the way, there are a ton of .NET listeners here. TechEd Malaysia had 2,000 attendees. It was packed. And people mm. kept running up to me saying, you are the toy boy. Oh, wow. They knew who I was, and they were very excited to meet me, and they loved the show. They were great. just thrilled, and they kept bringing me their toys. You cannot <laughs> imagine the gadgets I've seen. That's great. And that one of the gadgets that they showed me is one of, is my good toy this week. My okay. friend Ramin, who was an attendee at the conference, brought me an engineering sample of the new uh, MDA-3. This is a T-Mobile device. It is not available yet. Apparently, it's going to be out in Germany first. Hmm. And if you want to take a look at it, it's at shrinkster.com slash O is an Oscar zero. Now, that's the, uh, the, the T-Mobile Germany site, and it only uh, is in German. If you go to O1, there's a short review in English. But let me tell you about this PDA. You will be blown away. Okay. It looks like you know your iPad style PDA, <laughs> big screen. The keyboard pops out of the bottom, lights up, and it's a full keyboard. It's tiny, but you can operate with your thumbs. But built into this thing is quad band GSM, so it'll work on any kind of GSM wow. network anywhere, and Wi Fi. So it's Sweet. got Wi Fi right in it. Sweet. That's can what you I'm imagine? For. I've been waiting so he had. I actually yeah. held one of these in my hand had it in my hand, and I was playing with it, and then he said I couldn't keep it. I wanted Aww. to give it away. I mean, I really did. <laughs> yeah. But it was an engineering it sample. Anyway. It's one of the first ones. So, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, AT&T's got a GSM network. It's out there. You can make it work. Really? Okay. Yeah, truly. All right. Yeah, you ready for the bad toy? Yeah, let's see the bad and toy. And you remember, I looked long and hard for bad toys. <laughs> 
and I, I mean, I, the, the Hello Kitty USB key was one thing. And, uh, I found a frog mouse with the scrolly wheel as the nose of the mouse, uh, of the, uh, frog, but uh-huh. that, that didn't cut it either. Actually, my friend Goshkin, one of the RDs, bought it for his kids. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that couldn't do it. But the worst toy I've seen all week got emailed to me. I know you forwarded me an email from Greg Haslett about it. Gary Stanley emailed me as well. It's shrinkster.com slash N, as in November, V, Victor, N, V. N, V. This is <laughs> the nose envy. mouse. Okay. Nose envy. mouse. Ah. So this is this guy, and he's a Canadian researcher too, okay? So I'm almost embarrassed about this. <laughs> a Canadian researcher has developed a mouse system that tracks the position of your nose and your eyes. So you just point your nose, your pointer goes there. You blink, you double click. Oh. Okay. Now there's useful. There's technology. nothing good about this. <laughs> As if geeks didn't look stupid enough already. What if you're okay? Epileptic? Now we're looking around our screen. <laughs> I mean, I, you what know, if you got a nervous tick in your yeah, eye? Right. <laughs> Can you piece. imagine watching a guy playing Quake with this? <laughs> if I like have a really big zit on the end of my nose, is that going to affect you know my work? It's oh good. my god! Or on a six foot screen, you imagine you get one of those big plasma screens up there, and now you're now you're getting whiplash playing video yeah. games, going back and forth. Mark from last week's going to have one of those things around. That's his neck. right. He's going to have a neck brace. The ergonomic. Uh, computer thing well that's pretty good but uh i guess neither of these we can give away because uh the first one's only yeah. in germany and the second one is just a sort of a a preview so so we're going to go back to right we're going to go back to the toy that uh somebody bl- uh told us about in the in the yeah, mail segment. you mentioned in in your mail right and, and that's that the uh the fm transmitter which is a fabulous toy now what was that uh so the guy shrinkster could, link so everybody can get a look at yeah, it yeah that's uh what is it shrinkster.com hang on a second Hang on, hang on. N-E. Is it N-E? It's November Echo, N-E. <laughs> yeah, and this is so that he could listen to .NET Rocks in the shower on his shower radio. It broadcasts uh, from his MP3 player over FM, and he listens to it in the shower. How cool is that? And the best part is the price. It's less than 30 bucks. It's 26 bucks. So I say we'll give away, let's say, uh, six of these. Whoa. Yeah. So if you want to win uh, Richard's toy for the uh, for the week, the SI Link FM transmitter, which you can use on any portable device to transmit to an FM uh, radio, it looks like that it has a uh, what's the range here? The range is ten to twenty feet, depending on receiver quality. So you will you cannot take the uh, MP3 player to your neighbor's house. You have to ha- be in, probably in the same in the same room in the bathroom, I would imagine. If you're, if indeed you are taking a shower, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't mean to pry, you know, I can tell you how to live or anything. <laughs> <clears throat> so if, uh, Richard, what do, th- what do they have to do? What do they have to find? Usually you send them on, p- send people on a uh, treasure hunt in order to win this. That's uh, right. Yeah. So what you got? All right. Here is your question. You got to find the answer to this for me. It's in one of the websites just looked at. Actually, it's about this crazy modern mouse. I mentioned the guy was from Canada. Tell me what city he's based in. All Once right. You tell me what city he's based in. I will uh, hand over a couple of these things. And uh, while we're waiting for the first six listeners, we'll listen to a little bit of Franklin Brothers music. If you can tell us what city this guy is from in Canada that uh, invented the nose mouse, send that to .NET Rocks at franklins.net, and uh, the first six people we get in here will win. What do you think of that, Joe? Sounds cool. Six uh, six winners here. 
<clears throat> and I'll just uh, go through their names really quickly here so that we can uh, have them on. Some of them have won things before. That's okay. Doesn't mean that they can't win again. Uh, the first one is Lewis Parks and Ted Plaskonos. Plaskonos. All right. Sorry, Ted. Plaskonos. Probably a Greek name, right? Eric's Jarby. Uh, John Amick, Brian Sherwin, and that's uh, Bob Franken and Julian K. And what the heck, Daniel Reich, too. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. What the heck, we'll give away eight. So congratulations, guys. <laughs> you won. You won the toy. And uh, what can I say? So it's been fun. Uh, Joe, having you on the show, it's been great fun. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, it was a great just talking and hanging out with you. We don't get to talk as much as we should, you know. We yep. sort of live in the same area. but w- Work uh, just interferes with life so much. It just does. But it was great having you on. So uh, I'll see you probably up at the Code Camp up in Boston. I'll be there. All right. On behalf of myself and uh, Rory Blythe out in Portland, Oregon, and Jeff Maciolik in the sound room, <laughs> and uh, Kirk Webb in the studio. And uh, my guest, Joe Stagner, Richard Campbell, Kuala Lumpur. Thanks for listening.